This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for August 14th through the 20th. On this week's show, a legendary video is recorded and a king and queen die. Plus, we honor the birthday of a couple of musical icons and we throw in a little science. This show goes more in depth about some of the events that we put on our daily podcast, the Music History Today podcast, which drops every single day, including weekends, wherever you get your podcast from. Now, on to this week's episode. Kurt Cobain was born on February 20th, 1967 in Aberdeen, Washington. Kurt's parents divorced when he was nine, which affected him greatly. He started acting out in school, bullying kids, until he himself started to be bullied once he started hanging out with the misfits during high school. Kurt was kicked out of his mother's house when he was 18 years old. He drifted into a couple of relationships, including one with Tracy Miranda, who the song About a Girl is actually about, and Toby Vale of Bikini Kill, and whose relationship the vast majority of the album Nevermind is actually about. In fact, once Vales' bandmate, Kathleen Hanna, spray-painted Kurt Smells Like Teen Spirit on Kurt's wall. Teen Spirit was the deodorant that Vale used at the time. And now you know where the song title came from. Kurt met Chris Novoselic while practicing in a rehearsal space. They formed the band Nirvana, the name of which was taken from a Buddhist concept as Kurt was into religion at the time and wanted what he called a, quote, beautiful name. They also called themselves Skid Row for a little while, except that there was already a popular hair band of the same name, so that wasn't going to work out long term. Even though Nirvana is known as a classic three-piece lineup, they actually had Jason Everman playing rhythm guitar in 1989. They went through more than a few drummers as well. Aaron Burkhardt played drums in 1987. In 1988, they went through Dale Crover until they lost touch with him when they moved to Tacoma and Olympia, Washington. Remember, this was pre-internet and cell phones were still for rich people. Back then, when you lost touch with somebody, you really lost touch with somebody. They eventually did get back in touch with Dale, but in the meantime, they found Dave Foster and then Chad Channing. Channing played drums on their EP, Bleach. Channing didn't actually last that long. Then, after borrowing Dan Peters from the group Mud Honey, they got Dave Grohl, and that cemented Nirvana's classic lineup. Nirvana had three session musicians playing on their albums. Mark Pickerel played drums in 1989. Kirk Canning and Kira Shaley both played cello, Kirk in 1991 and Kira in 1993. They toured with four other musicians during the 93-94 tour. John Duncan played rhythm guitar. Lori Goldston and Melora Krieger played cello. And Pat Smear played rhythm guitar. And after their demise of Nirvana, Pat and Dave Grohl went on to, of course, form another group that was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame recently, the Foo Fighters. In 1988, Nirvana put out some music on Seattle's independent record label, Sub Pop. The first single was their release of shocking blues song, Love Buzz. They recorded their EP, Bleach, for $606.17 and released it on Sub Pop, who they had signed a contract with by then. They also recorded an EP called Blue, but a couple of things changed their history. The first was that Sub Pop didn't do a lot to promote Bleach, even though it was selling at a decent clip, and that did not sit well with the band, whose demos started making the rounds at the major record labels. Eventually, they ended up signing with DGC Records. The other thing was that Kurt and Chris did not like Chad's style of playing, and Chad wanted to write more music. And of course, one thing led to another, and Channing was out. 
And that is when they got Mud Honey's drummer Dan Peters to fill in while they did seven opening gigs with the group Sonic Youth, and then looked for a new drummer and found Dave Grohl. In 1991, Nirvana got to work on their next album, which they recorded in California. They decided that they needed to make a music video for their first song off of that album, Smells Like Teen Spirit. The band wanted a director who didn't have that slick corporate smell to him, so they settled on a guy named Samuel Bayer. Then they got a soundstage in Culver City, California, put out some advertisements for extras, and even invited their fans to show up for the video shoot during a concert there a couple of days earlier. On Saturday, August 17, 1991, the band got to work shooting the video. The video storyline was a concert at a high school that turns into total anarchy. They threw in shots of a janitor who was played by trivia answer Tony De La Rosa, along with cheerleaders dressed in black to drive the point home. The big problem with the shoot was how long the extras had to sit there on the bleachers without moving. For those of you unfamiliar with making videos, it sometimes takes forever. They have to do take after take after take, and these extras had to sit there for a really long time. By the time they were allowed to get up and film the total anarchy scene, the kids were really feeling it. They unleashed and turned the shoot into a mosh pit, which is exactly what Kurt Cobain wanted to begin with. What Kurt didn't want, though, was the original edit to the video. He hated it. In fact, he hated it so much that he had it re-edited. He even added that shot towards the end of himself screaming into the camera. Finally, the new edit was done and the video was released. On September 29, 1991, MTV played Smells Like Teen Spirit for the very first time. It turned into one of those watershed moments in music and especially for Generation X. It introduced grunge to the mainstream and the mainstream ate it up. It jump-started Nirvana's career along with the Seattle grunge movement, allowing groups like Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, and Soundgarden to follow suit. The video itself is considered one of the greatest music videos of all time, and it was all filmed on August 17, 1991. Next, the Woodstock Music and Art Fair better known as Woodstock, was a confluence of circumstances, aspirations, and artistic expression that transcended the boundaries of a mere music festival. It became a cultural touchstone, a defining moment of the 1960s counterculture movement, and a testament to the enduring power of music to unite and inspire. Yeah, and it was also that festival where all the baby boomers swear that they were at, even though they weren't really there. Even the ones that were born after 1969 said that they were there. Maybe in their parents' wombs, mind you. Anywho, conceived as a venture to fund a recording studio originally, the festival was the brainchild of a quartet of entrepreneurs, Michael Lang, Artie Kornfeld, John Roberts, and Joel Rosenman. Their vision of a, quote, three days of peace and music, end quote, resonated with a generation that was seeking an alternative to the prevailing societal norms at the time, otherwise known as hippies. The initial plan to host the event at a location in Woodstock, New York, proved logistically impossible, and the festival was ultimately relocated to Max Yasker's Dairy Farm in Bethel, New York a nearby town, so Woodstock never actually happened in Woodstock. Despite the 11th hour change in venue, word had spread and an estimated half a million people converged on the farm. The influx of people was unprecedented, overwhelming local infrastructure and straining resources there, and yet, in the face of logistical challenges, a sense of communal spirit prevailed at least according to the myth. Attendees shared food, water, and shelter, embodying the ideals of peace and love that the festival was meant to represent. 
At least that's the legend the grandparents like to tell you. Oh, yeah. And because so many people crashed the event and got past the gates, organizers announced that it was a free festival. Musically, though, Woodstock was chock full of amazing talent. From the soulful crooning of Richie Havens, who unexpectedly actually opened the show, he wasn't supposed to, to the incendiary guitar heroics of Jimi Hendrix on the final day with, of course, the Star Spangled Banner, the lineup was a virtual who's who of the era's most influential artists. Along with Hendrix and Richie Havens, you had The Who, Janis Joplin, Jefferson Airplane, Sly and the Family Stone, The Grateful Dead, and Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, among countless others that ended up giving legendary performances. Beyond the movement and the music, Woodstock was a celebration of art, fashion, and environmental consciousness. The festival was a petri dish, unfortunately, for experimentation as attendees pushed the boundaries of conventional dress, behavior, and self-expression. It also highlighted growing concerns about pollution and resource consumption as the sheer number of people on the farm placed an immense strain on the environment. However, the idyllic image of Woodstock often obscures the challenges and controversies that surrounded the event because, let's be honest, it was not organized well at all. Rain turned the farm into a muddy quagmire and the lack of sanitation led to health concerns. Let's be blunt, conditions were disgusting. The influx of people overwhelmed the local authorities and there were instances of crime and drug overdoses. The media, both mainstream and counterculture, offered a mixed portrayal of the festival, to be nice about it. Some emphasized the peace and love part of it, while others focus more on the chaos and debauchery, much like media these days. Despite its imperfections, Woodstock remains a powerful symbol of a generation's hopes and dreams. It was a moment when music transcended commercialism, until, of course, it became commercialism, and became a catalyst for social change, at least for like half a year. While the festival's legacy is complex and multifaceted, uh, there was no denying that it had an enduring impact on pop culture. Woodstock was more than just a concert. It was a cultural moment which continues to resonate with audiences. Again, mainly because your grandparents swear that they were even though they weren't. Listen, I grew up four hours away from there, and you would swear my entire town was at this thing from the way they all like to talk about it, even the ones who weren't even born in the 50s and 60s. Go figure. The organizers didn't even make money on the thing until they sold the movie and the soundtrack rights afterwards. And that movie actually became an award-winning documentary that is on one of the streaming sites. I forget which one. might actually be on YouTube. At least the music was awesome, so there you go. Woodstock, or the Woodstock Music Festival, or the Woodstock Music and Art Fair, happened from August 15th through August 18th, 1969, in Bethel, New York. Not actually in Woodstock. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. Next, we're going to talk about the deaths of the king and queen. The queen, of course, goes first. When you think of great singers whose work has stood the test of time, then Aretha Franklin has to be considered at least in the top five. 
Rolling Stone magazine named her the greatest singer, male or female, of all time. The Queen of Soul has 77 songs hit the Billboard Top 100 singles chart, 17 of which went to the top 10. She was the first female artist inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. She won 18 Grammy Awards and sold over 75 million records worldwide. She was the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, at least 12 honorary college degrees, including more than a few doctorates, I might add, and was given both the Grammy Legend Award and the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. She sang everything from gospel to pop to R&B to even classical music. Aretha was born on March 25, 1942 in Memphis, Tennessee, and started out as a youngster singing gospel in her father C.L. Franklin's church in Detroit, Michigan. Her father was a minister who became a bit of a celebrity in the Detroit area due to his energetic sermons. Because of this, as a child, Aretha knew people such as gospel legend Mahalia Jackson, who sometimes even babysat her, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whom she sang for before some of his rallies. Her childhood, despite knowing a lot of celebrities, was not an easy one. Her mom and dad divorced when she was six years old due to her father's multiple affairs. Her mom died when Aretha was 10. By the time Aretha was 14, she had two children. By the time she turned 18, Aretha decided to switch from singing gospel to R&B, following in her friend, singer Sam Cooke's footsteps. She first recorded with Columbia Records. In those six years, she only found mid-level success at best. In 1967, she went to Atlantic Records, and it was there where Aretha made her mark. Her first album at Atlantic, released on March 10th, was I Never Loved a Man the Way That I Love You. That album had the hits, I Never Loved a Man the Way I Love You, Do Right Man, Do Right Woman, Baby, 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 and her signature song, Respect. The irony of singing this song about empowerment was that at the same time, Aretha was in an abusive marriage with her manager, Ted White, whom she finally divorced a couple years later. Aretha wanted to record with the famed Muscle Shoals Rhythm Section at Fame Studios in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. She got to the studio and recorded I Never Loved a Man. Her recording session only lasted one day, though, as her husband slash manager got into a fist fight with Muscle Shoals owner Rick Hall on the first day of recording. She left the next day. Still, the vocals for the song were finished on the first day, so they were put onto the song. Her signature song, Respect, was originally recorded by Otis Redding. Aretha and producer Jerry Wexler added the sax solo in the middle, and the socket to me line was added by Aretha and her sister Carolyn. The album itself went to number one on Billboard's R&B chart and number two on the pop chart. The single Respect was number one on the pop chart, while the single I Never Loved a Man peaked at number nine. When it first came out, it was given decent reviews, except that some reviewers thought the musicians on the album could have been better. We're talking about the Muscle Shoals line up here, mind you. Time, of course, changes all things. This album set the stage for Aretha's rise, with her next couple of albums cementing her legacy. Her next album, Aretha Arrives, arrived only five months after her Atlantic debut album and had the hit Baby I Love You. Columbia Records, her former label, then tried to capitalize on Aretha's newfound success by releasing a compilation album called Take a Look only about a month after Aretha Arrives. And unless you're a huge fan of Aretha's and you need every single thing she's ever put out, you could probably just skip that compilation album. The album Lady Soul was her third album released by Atlantic in less than a year. Aretha started recording the album on February 16, 1967 at Atlantic Studios in New York City. Jerry Wexler was at the producing helm for this album again, and Aretha had some star power to back her up on this one. 
She had Eric Clapton on guitar and Bobby Womack and singing backup vocals were also Aretha's sister and gospel singer and mother of Whitney Houston, Sissy Houston. The big singles off of this album were You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman, which of course was written by Carole King, Chain of Fools, and Since You've Been Gone. The album was released on January 22, 1968 and went to number two on the Billboard Albums chart. Lady Soul is considered one of the greatest albums of all time on a lot of different best of lists. Her next albums, Aretha Now and Aretha in Paris, kept her on a roll with hits like Rock Steady and Daydreaming. And then she started hitting some speed bumps with a bunch of her albums towards the end of the 1970s. And by the end of 1979, Aretha and Atlantic Records parted ways. In 1980, Aretha signed with legendary record label head Clive Davis's label, Arista Records. Her first act with the new label was to film her part in the Blues Brothers movie. Her 1980 album, Aretha, did okay and yielded the hits United Together and her version of Otis Redding's song, I Can't Turn You Loose. Her follow-up, Love All the Hurt Away, did well, becoming her first gold record in years. Her 1982 album, Jump To It, did even better, with the song Jump To It becoming a big hit at the time. 1985's album, Who Zoom and Who, was her breakout album of the Arista era. Aretha by now had switched her sound to a more pop sound. It worked like a charm, with big hits like Freeway of Love with the saxophone of Clarence Clemens of Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. She also had the big hits Who Zoom and Who, and her worldwide hit duet with George Michael, I Knew You Were Waiting for Me, which went to number one. Who Zoom and Who was the zenith of Aretha's post-Atlantic career going platinum. In 1987, she was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the first woman to do so. After that, while she did albums that were mid-level in terms of sales, she settled into legend status, doing tours and special performances. There was, for instance, the 1988 Grammy Awards, where she filled in for Luciano Pavarotti, who was ill the night of the ceremony. The ceremony producers asked Aretha to step in and perform the aria Nessum Dorma, which she had performed with Pavarotti only a couple of nights before at a charity function. Aretha rehearsed with the orchestra for a little while, figured that she could sing it in the key that the orchestra already knew it in, and then delivered a performance of the ages that night, which is still talked about to this day, and garnered an extremely long standing ovation from the Grammy audience. Who knew that Aretha could sing opera? As the new century rolled on, Aretha continued touring, but her health concerns began to take their toll. She ended up canceling shows and shortening tours. Her final full concert was held on September 3rd, 2017, although she did give one more performance for Elton John's AIDS charity concert on November 7th, 2017. Aretha announced performance dates for 2018, but those dates were postponed, never to be fulfilled. On August 16th, 2018, on the same day in history that the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, passed away in 1977, and we'll get to him in a minute, the world lost the Queen of Soul at the age of 76. The death of the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, on August 16th, 2018. Now, Speaking of Elvis Presley, let us talk about the king of rock and roll for a few. It is said that there were four phases to Elvis's career. The first was when he burst onto the scene full of youth and vigor, shaking his hips, outraging the parents, and stealing the hearts of their daughters, of course. The second was when he was drafted into the army and then came out and did movies. Really bad movies when you watch them now, but you kind of look back on them fondly as a product of a bygone era. The fourth 
was Vegas Elvis, where he donned the white jumpsuit and put on a lot of pounds and pills, unfortunately, until he passed away. We'll get to the fourth phase in a minute. But there was an event that happened in the third phase that actually gave him his third phase. By 1968, Elvis was pretty much washed up as a rock and roll artist, at least in a lot of people's eyes. Yeah, he was doing those movies, but they were pretty campy and definitely about as far removed as you could get from what made Elvis Elvis, which was, of course, his swagger. Sorry, Clambake really does not have the same swagger as Hound Dog or Don't Be Cruel. Viva Las Vegas? All right, you could talk me into that one. Also, during his movie phase, he had put on a few pounds, some of which he would put back on again for Vegas Elvis. Plus, Bob Dylan and the Beatles had kind of stolen the swagger spotlight at that point, and rock and roll had completely changed into hard rock and psychedelic rock. So Elvis needed career help fast, or else he was going to be a permanent afterthought banished to the land of whatever happened to that guy. His manager, Colonel Tom Parker, sold NBC on an idea for a TV special, which was going to be a variety special. The director of the show, Steve Binder, saw it a different way. He wanted to do a mini-concert. It was to be a more intimate affair, with Elvis jamming in an intimate setting with his band. They would joke around back and forth and play a few songs, of course with a ton of pretty women around him. Because, you know, he's Elvis. Elvis signed on to the concept, but first he had to get into shape. He took his wife Priscilla and a then very young Lisa Marie on an extended family vacation in Hawaii. Because who doesn't? When they came back, Elvis was tan and, more importantly, trim like his younger self. And on the night of June 27, 1968, dressed in his now legendary black leather outfit, they began to record the special. It still almost didn't happen, though. Elvis got a case, a major case, actually, of stage fright. And even though he was calmed down at that point, you can still see how nervous he was at first if you pull up those clips on YouTube. Of course, Elvis being Elvis, those performing instinct kicked right in, and the swagger came back. After the success of the special, Elvis started to do concerts again. Unfortunately, a few years later, he ended up falling into the excesses of fame and turned into the caricature Vegas Elvis. After the success, he did start to go around, but his marriage to Priscilla Presley had started to deteriorate. He also started taking more prescription drugs. He had been against drugs like pot, cocaine, and the like, but he felt like a lot of people did at that point, that if a doctor prescribed it for you, then it wasn't illegal and it was pretty okay to take. I mean, the doctor's going to give it to you. The Presleys divorced in 1973. That starts phase four of his career. By then, his health was in a complete tailspin. He twice overdosed on barbiturates in 1973. He kept touring during this whole time, found himself a new girlfriend, but really was just not the same. According to members of his band, he would fall out of the limo, taking him to the performances, not even being able to stand up. He would lean against the microphone, slurring the words to his songs. He gained weight, a lot of weight. In short, Elvis was in a pretty bad way for at least the last four or five years of his life. His record label began to become concerned. Not so much about his health, apparently, but because he wasn't into recording albums anymore. His bodyguards started speaking out, but much like what happens when people speak out about such matters, they were let go. They went on, of course, to write a book, because that's what people do about Elvis's drug use, but that was actually released 16 days before Elvis's passing, and it was a book that Elvis actually tried to get stopped. In 1977, Elvis embarked on a cross-country tour. He started on February 12th in Hollywood, then swung east for a bunch of shows before going 
back to Hawaii for a vacation in early March. After his vacation, he went back on the road before he had to cancel some shows due to a stay in Baptist Memorial Hospital on March 31st. At that time, the press were told that it was for fatigue and an intestinal flu. April and May saw him hitting the road strong, crisscrossing the country back and forth. Elvis took the first couple of weeks in June off before doing a bunch of shows in the last two weeks of the month. He played Kansas City, Missouri, Omaha, Nebraska, Rapid City, South Dakota, Madison, Wisconsin, and Cincinnati, Ohio. On June 26, 1977, Elvis played at Market Square Arena in Indianapolis, Indiana. It was an 8.30 show. He walked out on stage to classical composer Richard Strauss's masterpiece, also Sprach Zarathustra. That was opus number 30, by the way a.k.a. the theme music for the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's probably better known that way. And then he went into C.C. Rider Blues, I've Got a Woman, Amen, Love Me, Fairy Tale, You Gave Me a Mountain, Jailhouse Rock, It's Now or Never, Little Sister, Teddy Bear, Don't Be Cruel, Release Me, I Can't Stop Loving You, Bridge Over Troubled Water, yes, the Simon and Garfunkel version, Early Morning Rain, What I Say, Ray Charles, of course. Johnny Be Good, Chuck Berry, of course. I Really Don't Want to Know, Hurt, not the Johnny Cash or Nine Inch Nails version, mind you. Hound Dog, of course, Big Mama Thornton. And finished it off with Can't Help Falling in Love. He walked off the stage. The announcer gave the traditional, ladies and gentlemen, Elvis has left the building. And that was it. 21 songs, the vast majority of them being cover songs. He gave one of the best performances of the year, as it turns out. What people couldn't have known at the time, including Elvis, was that it was the last performance he would ever give. Elvis Presley went back home to Graceland. There, he was supposed to rest up and then start the next leg of his tour. He was scheduled to start back up with two shows in Portland, Maine, and then do shows in Ithaca, Syracuse, and Uniondale, New York, Hartford, Connecticut, Lexington, Kentucky, Roanoke, Virginia, Fayetteville, and Asheville, North Carolina, before finally finishing the month with two shows at the Mid-South Coliseum in his hometown of Memphis, Tennessee. Those shows never happened. The end for Elvis came in a very undignified way. On August 16th, 1977, while sitting on the toilet in his Graceland mansion, Elvis Presley suddenly had a massive pain, stood up for a second, and then fell forward, face down. He tried to struggle, but to no avail. His new girlfriend found him, and although attempts were made to revive him, the drugs had taken their toll on his heart. Elvis Presley was pronounced dead from a heart attack brought on by 14 different drugs in his system at 3.30 p.m. on August 16, 1977. After that, of course, came the tributes. Over 100,000 people came to Graceland the very next day to pay their respects. Two small funeral services were held at the mansion on August 18th and August 19th, and then his body was originally moved to a mausoleum at Forest Hill Midtown Cemetery later that day on August 19th. His mother was moved there a week later on August 27th. At the service on August 18th, Minister C.W. Bradley said of Elvis, quote, We are to honor the memory of a man loved by millions, but Elvis was a frail human being, and he would be the first to admit his weaknesses. Perhaps because of his rapid rise to fame and fortune, he was thrown into temptations that some never experience. Elvis would not want anyone to think that he had no flaws or faults. But now that he's gone, I find it more helpful to remember his good qualities, and I hope you do too. End quote. On August 
30th, three men were charged with trying to steal Elvis's body. The charges were later dropped due to the court not believing the police's key witness. At that point, though, Elvis's father had made the decision to petition the city to allow Elvis and his mother to be buried at Graceland. On September 28th, that request was granted, and on October 3rd, 1977, Elvis and his mother's bodies were moved to their final resting place at Graceland. For those of you who wonder who the other celebrities who passed away around that time, a.k.a. all celebrities die in threes theory, and you stretch that theory over the next, say, four months, then there were some other legends who passed away. Groucho Marx actually passed away three days after Elvis on August 19th. Bing Crosby passed away on October 4th from a heart attack after playing a round of golf. And the legendary Charlie Chaplin passed away on Christmas Day. The death of the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, on August 16th, 1977. Okay, after that, how about some birthdays? First, let's talk about the lead singer of one of the greatest hard rock bands of all time. Robert Plant was born in the industrial heartland of England on August 20th, 1948. Plant's early life was actually steeped in a lot of musical influences. His father, who was a civil engineer, and his mother, who was of Romani descent, exposed him to a very diverse musical group. He had the raw energy of the blues and rock and roll around him, along with the traditional folk music of his mother's heritage. Robert's musical foundation was laid at a very young age. His teenage years saw him immersed in the British musical scene. Inspired by the likes of Elvis, Muddy Waters, and Sonny Boy Williamson, Robert began honing his vocal skills and his stage presence. He cut his teeth in local bands, gaining experience as a frontman. And it was during this period that he crossed paths with John Bonham, who was the drummer who had become a major part of his musical journey. The formation of Led Zeppelin in 1968 marked a pivotal moment in Plant's career and also, of course, in music history. Joined by Jimmy Page, John Paul Jones, and, of course, John Bonham, the band quickly ascended to stratospheric heights. Plant's powerful, expressive vocals, combined with the band's innovative blend of blues, rock, and folk music, created the sound that has resonated to this very day. Their albums, such as, of course, Led Zeppelin 1, 2, Led Zeppelin 4, and Physical Graffiti, are considered cornerstones of rock music, and Plant's lyrics, which was mixed with mythology, mysticism, and, of course, raw emotion, added depth and complexity to the music. The 70s were a decade of unparalleled success for Led Zeppelin. Their live performances were legendary. Plant's charismatic stage presence and acrobatic antics captivated audiences worldwide. However, the band's relentless touring schedule and the pressures of fame took their toll. A tragic motorcycle accident in 1975 nearly killed Robert Plant, and the band was forced to take a hiatus. The aftermath of the accident was a turning point for Robert. Confronted with his own mortality, he began to question the direction of his life and career. The subsequent years saw a gradual shift in his musical focus as he explored new genres and sought to expand his artistic horizons. Led Zeppelin's eventual disillusion in 1980, after the untimely death of John Bonham, was a devastating blow to the rest of the members who were left alive. Plant was left to navigate the complexities of grief and an uncertain solo career. At least it was uncertain at that point. His initial solo efforts met with mixed success, but he persevered, released a series of albums that showcased his versatility as a singer-songwriter. 
He then ended up getting enormous success with the song Big Log and a bunch of other songs. So his solo career ended up pretty good and in the end. In the 1990s, Plant embarked on a collaboration with Alison Krauss, resulting in the Grammy-winning album Raising Sand. That project marked a significant departure from his rock roots as he then embraced the world of bluegrass and Americana. The album's success not only revitalized Plant's career, but it also introduced him to a whole new audience. Throughout his career, Robert Plant has remained an innovative artist. He has collaborated with a wide range of musicians from bluegrass legends to contemporary rock stars and has explored a lot of different musical genres. His willingness to always take the risk and embrace his new challenges has ensured that he has continued relevance in the music industry. The birth of the legendary Mr. Robert Plant, August 20th, 1948. Next, this woman was born in Michigan but made a name for herself in the underground club scene in New York City. She is strong-willed, ambitious, and in control. She writes a lot of her own songs and helps to produce them. She has broken barriers with her blatant use of sexuality and religion, which usually pissed off everybody except for her diehard fans. Oh, and of course, she also had all those high-profile romances back in the day. She is a very underestimated businesswoman. She started her own record label, which saw early success with hit albums by Alanis Morissette and Candlebox. She's written children's books, opened health clubs, delved into the world of fashion and movie making. That last one with very mixed results at best. She has also used stage performing and music videos to create visual masterpieces, and of course, she created an awful lot of controversy to go with. She has had at least three of her videos banned by MTV, although if MTV actually played music videos these days, they would probably be considered tame, especially compared to things like, say, the Fifty Shades trilogy. She made every video viral before the internet be made things viral to begin with. If she had a new music video come out, you ran home to see it. If she was on a magazine cover, you bought it. If she put out a fine art book of risque photos, you bought that too. She broke the internet before the internet could be broken or before the internet was even the internet. As far as her awards go, she sold over 300 million records worldwide. She's had 14 albums, only four of which did not go multi-platinum, but all but one of which went gold. Eight of her albums went number one on the Billboard Albums chart, with the rest of them hitting either number two or number three. She's had three soundtrack albums, all of which went multi-platinum and were top ten on the charts. She's had six compilation albums, four of which were multi-platinum. She is, of course, Madonna, who was born on August 16th, 1958. And finally, it is time for a science lesson as we are going to celebrate the birthday of sorts of a machine in honor of our future overlords, provided, of course, that there hasn't been a nuclear holocaust by then. In the early 1960s, NASA realized that the planets would be aligned in the 1970s in such a way that a spacecraft could do a single flyby of the planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. That was pretty forward thinking on their part since man was still trying to stay in space for longer than half a minute, at least in space exploration. They decided to do two space probe missions. They called them Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 Electric Boogaloo. Okay, maybe not the Electric Boogaloo part. Voyager 2's main mission, of course, was to go by these four planets. Voyager 2 was launched on August 20th, 1977, and it is still to this date going pretty strong. 
Having now completed its primary mission, its new mission is to go to the farthest reaches of the solar system to find out what's out there. And as of this recording, it is actually 12.7 billion miles away and has been out of the solar system since 2018. Now, why on earth am I telling you all of this? Well, because of what is on the Voyager spacecraft. See, on the spacecraft, NASA put a gold record. The record is essentially a time capsule. It has photos of people and animals interacting, earth sounds like wind blowing and birds chirping, and it has music on it from different countries. It has a few cuts from Bach, one from Mozart, one from Stravinsky, one from Beethoven, along with a Navajo tribe chanting, a Peruvian wedding song, and other traditional ethnic music. The entries from the United States, other than the Navajo tribe chanting, well, it has Chuck Berry's Johnny B. Good the only rock music cut to make the record. It also has Louis Armstrong's Melancholy Blues, not West End Blues for some weird reason, and Blind Willie Johnson's Dark Was the Night, Cold Was the Ground. Carl Sagan, by the way, who helped to put the list together, wanted the Beatles' Here Comes the Sun to be put on there, but EMI, who owned the copyright at the time, said no, because why would you ever want your record to be part of a truly historic event? Jeez. Further proof of how stupid. Stupid record execs can be sometimes. No, we own the copyright, so just in case the aliens actually listen to it, we can't collect our royalties. <laughs> oh, dear Lord. What I really enjoy about all of this is that on the record is a drawing that's a set of instructions on how to play it. There's no record player with it because, well, why would you ever want to make it easy for anybody? It's like when you get a new toy or electronic device and realize that the batteries don't come with it. I'm imagining the aliens looking at the record like kids these days look at cassettes, curse us, and then throw the record around like a frisbee while making plans to invade us. Good job, NASA. You had one job. Give them a record player with a needle. You couldn't even do that. <sighs> anyway, the golden record and the space probe that it was put on, Voyager 2, Electric Boogaloo, launched into space on August 20th, 1977. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth podcast for August 14th through the 20th. Thanks for listening and or watching. Please like and subscribe.